it was definitely the same feeling where it was like I can reshape like the history of Melee right here. Like something that I've watched since 2014, 2015. It's like I am about to make an impact on this. Like you, you become aware of that. And when you realize that it's in your hands, it's like, I don't want to mess this up. Like, I, I want to leave a mark here. It's 2018, and Boston, Massachusetts is playing host to its third installment of Shine, a Northeastern National Tournament series for Super Smash Bros. Melee. The number one ranked player in the world, Team Liquid's Hungrybox, enter this tournament with expectations of claiming another gold medal alongside a two-year win streak at the New England Super Major. Heading into winter semis, Hungrybox's matchup against the up-and-comer Zane was predicted to add another win to his already growing collection of sets against the new school Marth player. But it wouldn't go that way. Not at all. In a competitive fighter beginning to exit an era defined by five unbeatable players, Zane would defy all odds and show the world that even the gods can bleed. You did it! How do you feel? It feels like a dream, honestly. <laughs> I can't. I can't believe it. Run for your life. You know, I had no intention of like making a career out of melee or anything. It was just something I started to pick up in college, uh, just as a pastime, because I was planning on joining like a bunch of clubs and stuff when I entered my freshman year. But then once I had joined like the Smash Club, I was like, okay, this this is it. I'm I'm completely hooked. Shine 2018 was a national level Super Smash Bros. Melee tournament, taking place on August 24th to 26th at the Seaport World Trade Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Overlooking the historic Boston Harbor, the massive 118,000 square foot venue held 1,399 attendees, 904 of which had entered the Melee singles bracket. Although it took a dip in numbers from Shine 2017, the series would see itself become a mainstay in the Melee community, as well as the namesake tournament for Smash in the Northeast. New England's premier event would also be a welcome addition to the Melee tournament circuit, as prior to Shine, the last time the region held a major was all the way back in 2004 for MLG Boston. The third installment of Shine would deliver just as much excitement as the previous two years. S2J got the Pokemon Stadium glitch against Plup in a real tournament set. First time, could we see? Oh, what the what? hell? Whoa! Shroom went on a very impressive loser's run with four straight five-game sets, followed by a 3-0 against Nunn to qualify for top eight, which felt fitting when you think about his dramatic set versus Mewtwo King at Shine 2016. We agreed to no chain grabs. <laughs> and so, you know, we're having a good set, and then I slowly start fucking him up. <laughs> you he's getting, fucking him up, He's dude. getting fucking whooped. Yeah, he's getting whooped. And game four, or I win game three, and he's just like, all right, uh, chain grabs on next game. And Ninja even offered to add $50,000 to the prize pool if Joseph Mango Marquez ended up winning the event. Mango, on a bit of a dry streak through 2018, having not won an event in the year, did not end up breaking his curse here. He exited Shine 2018 with a bronze medal, losing in winner's finals to the eventual winner of the tournament. I love the tournament victories where I get to sort of geek out as a commentator about people doing something new, bring, bring something fresh to the table. But before we get there, we should probably talk a bit more about that person who won Shine and why it's so important. Zane Nagmi was born on June 11th, 1996, and he's considered the current best Marth player in the world. At the time of Shine, however, he was only beginning to grasp at the top. He first began competing in Melee in 2014, joining the ranks of the self-proclaimed Documentary Kids, a group of players having joined the game through Travis Samox Beauchamp's The Smash Brothers documentary. But he spent a good chunk of his first year at Virginia Tech competing in local tournaments. Nothing quite at the national level just yet, but enough attendance to start to get his name out there. At Virginia Tech, Zane would be introduced to Samit Mahone Gianni. A senior, the most dominant player at the school, and perhaps most importantly, a Jigglypuff main. 
I always joke about being his mentor, but uh, <laughs> the truth of it is just that like, when he was starting out, I would just throw out these like, throwaway comments, and he would take them and just do incredible things with them. Almost a year after his first local event, Zane would enter and win the Smash at Xanadu Fall Arcadian, a tournament format designed for lesser known players where anyone currently ranked was ineligible to compete. It was formative for me to like play through that and like kind of have that, I was expected to win and play with that presence. Uh, it just gave me more confidence as a player. From there, he would see some impressive results through early 2016, 49th at Pound and Evo 2016 and 33rd at Super Smash Con. But it wasn't until almost a year right after the Fall Arcadian where he made his first big splash at the national level. Having beaten 2016's Global Rank 6 Plup at the Midwest Super Major, the Big House 6. Zane would wrap up the Big House 6 with a 17th place finish, including other notable wins over Tapikins and KJH, and conclude the year with enough evidence to make his first appearance on the biannual SSBM rank at 66th. Zane's 2017 would continue on a hot streak with a 5th place peak for the year at Super Smash Con 2017, which would be enough to move him up a whopping 44 places on next year's global rank, now entering at 22nd in the world. Things were looking really good, but despite this rapid improvement, one thing remained consistent. He couldn't beat Jigglypuff. More specifically, he couldn't beat Juan Hungrybox Debbie Edma. Adaptations to be made against Hungrybox, you'd have to do against other Jigglypuff players, or, or completely just in theory. That sort of arms race phenomenon against Hungrybox is always kind of, it's, it's always weird, it's always different. There were at least several top players who were doing, who would have to do this really weird kind of independent study for Hungrybox. In 2017, Hungrybox had near undefeated records against almost every character in Super Smash Bros. Melee. Alongside Reputation as one of the five gods of Melee, a near unbeatable group of five Melee players who defined the meta from 2008 to 2015, Hbox's dominance against the field translated to his first ever appearance as Melee's Global Rank 1 player, with only a handful of losses to Fox, Falcon, and Sheik. Most new players don't like playing Puff. Uh just because she kind of breaks the rules of the game. He had taken a few losses to other characters in addition to the aforementioned three, like Falco and even Yoshi, over the last six months, but one thing was constant. Hungrybox did not lose to Marth. At this point in time, people were talking about how Jigglypuff was unbeatable if you weren't playing Fox, all this stuff. Stuff that, like, I think people on a theoretical level knew could not possibly be true, but, you know, no one was actually doing it, right? So, um... Part of the reason I think Melee is cool is because even though it's as old as it is, there's a lot of like, you know, obviously there's always a lot of hidden potential. Um, and yeah, at the time, I mean, people that weren't Fox players just weren't beating Hungrybox. In fact, the last time Hungrybox lost in a best of five set to a Marth player was over three years prior at Apex 2015 against Kevin PewPewU Toy. And Zane's early beginnings against Hbox proved that he was no exception to the rule. People just didn't have that opinion of, of the matchup before. Um, Sort of saying, PPU showed it was possible, but then then Zane showed it was consistent. Their first ever tournament encounters were in 2017 at Bad Moon Rising 2 and Super Smash Con 2017, both 3-0s in favor of Hungrybox. While Zane had a good showing at Smash Con 2017 with that stunning fifth place finish, including wins over Chudat, Lod, Rishi, and Sfat, there was a clear level above him. The next year, Zane would meet Hbox in winter semis at Smash Valley 7. A 3-0 there, and another one in the Grand Finals runback. Four months later at Smash and Splash 4, Zane figured something out. He took a win on a Yoshi Story counterpick to get on the board for the first time ever, but loses this time 3-1. Super Smash Con 2018, Zane took two games to force a Game 5 against Hungrybox for the first time ever, but closer than ever before, he lost again. To see someone lose like that is, you know, of time and time again, especially if their friend is like really heartbreaking, especially because I knew I knew he could do it. I mean, he was just doing so much stuff in that matchup that no other Marth was doing. Six sets, six losses. But something felt different here. Zane had begun working with Arjun, Junebug, Rao over the span of that year to dissect the Hungrybox matchup. And across every best of five set he played against Hbox leading up to Shine, there were very clear marks of improvement. I think analysis was my weak point as a player where I would just play, 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 play. Execution was my strength, just getting better at like the tech skill stuff. Um, 
just getting better by playing. But June kind of showed me how to like break down the game, slow it down, understand what your opponent wants at certain percents. He would learn things instantly. Like um, he was so good at picking things up. A lot of the times people are trying to get good at the game, they ram their head against the wall. They're like, why isn't this working? I'll just keep grinding, I'll get better. But if you just like think about the game, think about sort of the interactions that can take place, um, it becomes a lot easier. Zane, I think also, especially at the time, uh, really I think to me represented somebody who was very good at taking a matchup he would struggle at, or that Marth would struggle at, and kind of just kind of innovating and innovating and innovating until eventually the wins were consistent. You could see it in the game count. 0-3, 1-3, and most recently 2-3, Zane was knocking on the locked door of a victory over an infallible hungry box, and it was only a matter of time until he found the right key. Over the summer, I'd played hungry box a handful of times, uh, and it was getting closer and closer. I was getting 3-0'd, then it was 3-1, then it was 3-2, uh, and I was like, I can definitely do this. Like, it's getting better every time. In a double elimination tournament, both players have the opportunity to advance further after falling in the winner's side bracket but they need to play twice the sets in the loser side bracket to make it to the same placement. The winner side bracket serves as a bit of a cushion to advance as far as possible, and the loser side is where everything is for keeps. Zane would first play through Golden and PRZ in pools, followed by Drunk Sloth, Lucky, and Nun in top 64 of bracket in order to qualify for top eight. That tournament sucked. I hate the Arduinos. <laughs> Zane encountered Hungrybox in winner semis of Shine, well into top eight of the bracket, and with a guarantee for fifth place even if he were to lose here and in his following loser side set. With a full year of losses to reflect on, it was time to see if Zane could finally pop the bubble. Let them know for real this time who's gonna be playing in our winner semifinal number two. The two sit down in adjacent seats, and after a few minutes of discussion and setup, the first game commences on Battlefield. Things look all right. Zane clearly has a plan, and he's picking up on habits that he and Junebug discussed, like an immediate nair out of shield on Hbox's blocked bear. Out of all the gods, he's the most patterned player. Back then in Melee, I think everybody was just trying to beat an Hbox. Hbox was just by far the most consistent player. I thought he had a lot of habits. I, I from seeing the game with my lens, I thought that that there were a lot of things that were exploitable. Just seven seconds in, Zane drops shield for a counter option and gets hit with a stray up tilt from Hbox, which converts into a tech chase rest. Perhaps a bad omen, but this is a matchup of inches and Zane knows it. Hungrybox is really good at just kind of wearing people down, kind of like the game outside the game, just, you know, stalling them out when they're having good momentum and, uh, you know, doing, I don't want to say weird stuff because I think it's, you know, calculated, but just doing things to throw people off in all those clutch situations. The discipline continues, well-spaced aerials into immediate resets or calculated follow-ups. Hbox bears, Zane blocks, Zane nares. Rinse, repeat. But as much as Zane is able to restrain himself, a forced issue results in a huge string from Hungrybox, which ultimately leads to a second stock. Those inches turn to feet. After about a minute of back and forth, Zane gets his first stock on the board with first hit Dancing Blade into up tilt at 167%. He opens up the following stock with a 37% sequence, but Hbox breaks up the action with the bear and makes it a two-stock game yet again. Zane answers back with the grab to F-Smash conversion, but it's too little too late. Hungrybox takes the first game with a two-stock, and the pressure is on Zane to adjust. Game 2 is a counterpick to Yoshi's story, and the macro strategies are already showing brilliantly. Zane doesn't overextend, baits Hbox's pound, converts that into three fares, a dash dance grab, and an F-throw F-Smash. Just a few seconds later, Hbox drifts into another grab from Zane, and the Puff's first stock is gone. If we look at all these matches, and you look at certain percent ranges, you can tell, almost like he's a boss battle, like exactly what he's gonna do. Zane carries this momentum into a low percent three stock on Hungrybox, tying the set one to one. In a best of five set, players are not given the opportunity to ban a stage. They also can't counterpick to a stage they've already won on. This is unique from traditional fighters because different stages affect character matchups due to a number of factors like their size, blast zone locations, or platform heights. Hungrybox takes Zane to the as expected Dreamland 64 counterpick for Game 3. In 2018, and even to this day, Dreamland 64 remains an excellent counterpick for Jigglypuff. 
The large blast zones allow for Puff to survive later into each stock, and against a character like Marth, kill options can become more challenging if not impossible to convert after a certain percent, which allows Hungrybox to thrive in single neutral wins. To most players in the current era, the way to beat Hungrybox in a best of 5 set was to steal away at least one game on Dreamland. But most players in the current era also conceded that Hbox would win on the stage very, very often. As stocks are traded back and forth, Zane finds a grab almost 5 minutes into the game and converts a pivot tipper. Hbox barely dies. With the crowd behind him, Zane takes game 3 on Hbox's comfort pick, and he only needs a single game win to take the set and advance to winner's finals. But the lead wouldn't last. Hungrybox makes a return visit to Dreamland for Game 4 and convincingly 3 stocks Zane to bring our set to Game 5. As the final stocks of Winter Semis wind down, shades of all of his sets before come flooding in. I was slowly becoming more and more numb to the feeling of like, uh, this is Game 5 last stock. And instead of like really overly thinking about it, I would just recognize that those feelings exist and be able to concentrate at the same time. Um, Hbox in particular is really good at, in high 10 situations, completely shifting his game plan at the like weirdest moments, like last stop, when it really, when it really matters. And I think being aware of that, more aware of that after the Smash Con set uh, was really helpful. I assume it was more challenging if you're playing a different character. At the same time, maybe in some ways you can exploit Hungrybox's lack of understanding on things, but even if that's true, and even if that has been proven to be true with things like, you know, Hungrybox's DI and things like that, um, it sure probably didn't feel like it when you're trying to beat the number one player. You assume that, oh man, you know, he's, you know, this guy's so good, he's gonna have an answer for this stuff, right? So I better make sure I'm even more prepared. I think the way he did it kind of like told me, and by Hungrybox's body language, it kind of like told me yeah, he's got it in the bag. Before you know it, it would be Zane taking his first ever win against Hungrybox. The first Marth to beat Hbox since Apex 2015, right on the Boston main stage, with all of his friends watching. Your losses make it all the more satisfying. The culmination of everything that I wanted, <laughs> like, I just like hung out with a bunch of friends after that, uh, June included, just like, going out to eat, going out to drink, uh, just like sharing in the moments with people who genuinely care about me and who I genuinely care about. Um, I think sharing that moment with them, like the afterglow of that experience was something that was really, really um, enjoyable for me. When the dust finally settled, it was Zane emerging the victor. His 3-2 set win at Shine was his first ever win over Hungrybox, and it positioned him incredibly well for the rest of the tournament. With one obstacle overcome, the next challenge would be in the other god attending Shine 2018 and the second place finisher in last year's iteration of the tournament, Joseph Mango Marquez. It was definitely my best matchup against the gods at the time, because I hadn't lost him at that point. Uh, I mean, I think it was only 2-0 um, from Summit and then Smash and Splash where he was insanely drunk and it was a 3-0 in like five minutes, I think. With potential to go up 2-0 in the set, Mango, in classic Mango fashion, goes for a stylish follow-up which costs him the stock and ultimately the game. He's got the Marth killer. Yeah. When you roll toward the ledge, oh, he went too risky, Mango! He would bring Zane to a last stock game five, but when Zane finished the game with a rather plain edge guard, he nodded, acknowledged Mango, and turned to the crowd. Only Grand Finals remained, and only a rematch against one of the gods stood between him and Glory. And as fate would have it, Shine 2018 would continue to test the mettle of the young Marth player. Zane would need to surpass his limits against Hungrybox for a second time to take home a gold medal, his first win, and mark the beginning of a postmodern era of Melee. Welcome back. Let's play some Melee. With Vish, I'm Chroma. We've got Shine 2018 Grand Finals for this beautiful, beautiful game. We have Liquid Hbox, the number one in the world, playing Jigglypuff, facing one of the greatest rising stars that this game has ever seen. Right. PG Zane. Everybody's Ooh. ready. Yeah. People are talking about Zane like he's the savior of Melee. One the last gatekeeper remains in Zane's way. Can yeah. he do it? And this is it. Grand Finals. Best of five. Zane versus oh. Hungrybox. Hbox again with the rest. Yeah. We hear pop that 
that bubble. <laughs> Bus continues to do that. That's some crunch. Crunch helped him out of that. Oh, but not that time. Zane, very solid game one. Oh my god. And again, Zane is in winner's side of Grand Finals, so he only needs to take three games to win this tournament. Zane tried to go for his patented edge cancel. Oh my god. god. Every time. Can we talk about that pivot a little bit? He's going to have to keep up this energy for maybe two very grueling sets if he can't finish it off here. Ooh, goes for the second hit on the side B. And oh, he's oh. out of there. Oh my god. He's, oh. he's up 2-0 in Grand Finals. Zane with the mini pop up as well. Zane could close this out with the most uh, with the most flawless stock we've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, dude, he's got it in him. Oh, uh, but it looks like H-Box is going to keep that one home. And H-Box on the board. Oh my god, he's off stage. The nail will send him off. H-Box possibly on his last stop of the tournament. He needs to take this out fast. Zane needs a quick 50%. Yeah. One stock away from oh, the mix up correctly. I thought it was cool how there was a lot of success that Zane was getting with the side B, like the first hit side B early on in the set. And then it was like, and then H-Box kind of found an answer to it and he'd like crouch it. And then at the very end, it was like two hits of something. Like popped him up and got So Armada actually gave me some advice too, versus Puff before this tournament. And he had told me to use double hit side B to break the Puff's crouch cancel. Uh, and that definitely came into play uh, last stock. You only get one shot at the king. Okay, up air. Oh, he got the up to the top platform. Okay, yeah, I can recognize these sound cues so well. I've watched this moment so many times. Oh. Yeah, he crouches for tell him this. <laughs> Zane is showing us a whole new world right now. This is a whole new world of melee. As I got better at melee, I realized that the coolest thing for me, I love the game so much, but there will be a time where it's like, it's not gonna be everything to me. And I think the more valuable thing is, what was I able to learn from the game? Zane's win at Shine 2018 would mark him as one of a very select few players in Melee to take a major tournament over any attending five gods. At the time, Zane was ranked 22nd in the world, leaving him as one of the lowest ranked players to ever win a major tournament. He would quickly jump up to Global Rank 9 in the summer of 2018, and then to Rank 7 in 2018's full Top 100 listing. The first major win in Melee for an MDVA local since Azen at Viva La Smash to Clism in 2007. The first documentary kid to win a national tournament. The first win over a seemingly unstoppable Hungrybox. Looking at like Zane's record against Hungrybox and how it was like 03 every time, 03, and then it was like 1 3, and then it was like always 1 3, and then it was always like 2 3. I think players with records like that where you can actually really just track their progress and it's very crystal clear it kind of like makes you feel good as like a fan of the game because you're like, look, this is, a, this is a data point that we have that's really easy to point to that shows us that hard work pays off. This doc kid proved that he was able to take tournaments over Melee's elite. The metagame was forever changed and another major winning contender had risen from the ranks. A fitting end or beginning, however you choose to look at it. After that point, it was solidified in my head, like, I can win anything. Zane is one of a select few who was perhaps struggling to wrap his head around the implications of a major tournament win. Discussions about Melee as a competitive title, especially in 2018, had pegged the game as a relatively rigid esport. It's never been updated, matchups were seemingly solved and at their skill ceiling, and its upper echelon had over 10 years to figure it all out. Surely there's no room at the top for a so-called documentary kid. To have a player like Zane, an outlier, someone on the perimeter of greatness, but someone who hadn't quite broken in just yet, win Shine 2018? If that's not a sign to reconsider the rather monolithic outlook of Melee, I don't know what is. Plup won Genesis, Leffen won Evo, Zane won Shine. The era of the five gods was over. Maybe all it took was overcoming Mango to allow him to defeat Hungrybox. Maybe all it took was a pop the bubble chant to let a young competitor believe he can dismantle godhood. But maybe, just maybe, there's something more lying right beneath the surface. 
and against all gods. It's this turning point which leaves Zane a champion. Zane Nagmi, tag is Zane uh, from Virginia. Been playing Melee since 2014, and I'm on Golden Guardians. Run for your life. To see the full uncut interviews, consider supporting Turn Down for Walt on Patreon. I guess if you want to do any kind of ending, can I do this? It's like, I'm Zane, and you're watching Golden Guardians. <laughs> oh, let's go. <laughs> that was sick. <laughs>